Hey, 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 we back, everybody. Welcome back to I've Been Falsely Accused, part 16. And we got Mr. Jeffrey Deskovic, who's with me in right now. Jeffrey, my brother, how you doing? I'm great, Coach. How are you? All right. This is a heavy show today, Jeffrey. We definitely bringing it through again. How do you feel about the show so far? And, you know, with us bringing Victor in, you know, somebody who reached out to us, and we definitely pulled him in to show that me and you, we don't ignore, you know, no emails or no nothing that come to us. We got people that read stuff for us, and they definitely tell us about it. But if we feel like it's something we can help, Real quick, we really get up on it, but if we can't help, it don't mean that we don't care. We're just busy. Can you break it down real quick? Yeah, look, Coach, I'm on the go close to 24 hours a day, you know. I mean, from going to travel to different places to do conferences to, you know, media outlets to, uh, you know, coordinating legislative um, uh, initiatives uh, to, you know, make, try to, you know, work to make my foundation sustainable to making outreaches even on, on the guests on the show, you know, lining people up. And it's 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 exhausting, you know. So I just want people to keep that, you know, in mind. It's not it's not a simple thing that that either one of us are are, are engaged in. It's pretty That's involved, right. and it takes time. So believe me, it ain't nothing personal on me and your end. Why we can't do some of the things people might want us to do for them, right? No, absolutely not, Coach. I, if it was up to me, I'd do everything for everybody. But you know, un- unfortunately, you know, there's only a limited amount of time in the day. I can only be in so many places. Uh, uh, at once, you know. That's right. You're definitely right about that. So I want to thank my whole team and Jeffrey's whole team who do, you know, let us know all the emails that come in and let us know when the people, you know, about the stories and what they're going through. And, you know, everybody, I definitely, you know, have a special guest that will be coming in in a, in a minute, Mr. Youssef Salam. I mean, he's a good brother. He's a part of the Century Park Five. And, uh, I mean, this is a deep story. He was on with me last week. And, you know, Victor, I'm glad you're with us today. And, Victor, you're going to hear these different stories that I hope will really make you fight for the love of your family, but make you fight for the love of yourself. You get what I'm saying, Victor? Yeah. Because, number one, the, the harder you fight for your own life, the more convincing you are to other people. You feel me? Okay, so, you know, we'll have uh, Mr. Youssef, he'll be in in a minute, and he's definitely going to talk to you about what it means to fight for your life and why you should fight for your life. I mean, when I say great information that this young man has right now, and he done been through the worst of the worst, being scrutinized through the, the news, being put under pressure, you know, from people in his inner city, having his parents threatened, going through so much, you know, and he beat the case. But the thing about it, all the years he had to do in prison. To beat the case. And that's what Obi was trying to explain to you. That's what Jeffrey was trying to explain to you. And Yousef, he's going to break it down to you. I mean, he's going to break it down to you so good because, I mean, he really done been there and done that. All these guys done been there and done that. But I think to each person that you done talked to, it's going to get a little deeper, you know, through because they all went through different things. But they all was bad for each one of them. But it's a serious if we all don't stick together as a community and we all don't help each other to grow and we all don't help each other to get to that right information that can help our fellow man, I mean, we're going to be extinct. And it ain't going to be because we dying. It's going to be because we in prison. We behind bars. And, Victor, I feel like you're a young man. You shouldn't be there, especially if you didn't have nothing to do with it. And that will make your parents smile so big and y'all have the best party y'all ever had in y'all's life. When y'all celebrating this victory, you know, of being, you know, falsely accused. You get what I'm saying? Right, yeah. So I want y'all to hold on, stay locked in. We're going to bring my man in, Mr. Youssef Salon. He'll be in in a minute. I definitely got to celebrate him with song because this man has been through a lot. But this song goes out to everybody who's fighting right now. We need to wake up. We need to understand this world ain't all about just us. It's about relationships in this world, and we need them to get by. We got to love people, and we got to let people love on us the right way to help us see a brighter day. So that's what I'm trying to do. And Jeffrey, and you listening to the I've Been Falsely Accused show we'll be right back hey hey hey! we back everybody welcome back to i've been falsely accused part 16 and i definitely want everybody you know to definitely learn from this show i want you to take notes i want you to talk to people about this show i want you to email people text people facebook the show i mean this is something that Every family is going through in some kind of way through something that we can be a tool to help people move forward. And I'm praying that 
for the families that ain't going through nothing. That's a great thing. But one thing I do want to do, you know, and we talked about this on break a minute ago. We definitely want to pray for the family of this little girl who's going through whatever she's going through on Victor's end. You know what I'm saying? As well. You know, we can't we, we can't never leave the children out because they the victims of this situation. And, you know, we just definitely want to pray that the truth comes out and this young man is able to walk free and, you know, his name is cleared and then he can come on the show and be a testimony of what he been through and why other people should fight as well. So what I want to do, Jay, you can definitely roll the red carpet for our guest. I, I, I can't wait to get him in. This young man is so on fire and, you know, he has a big heart for the community. Mm-hmm. Definitely. The Central Park jogger case involved the assault and rape of a female jogger in New York City's Central Park on April 19, 1989. Five juvenile males, four black and one of Hispanic descent, were tried and convicted for the crime and served their sentences fully. The convictions were vacated in 2002 when Matthias Reyes, a convicted rapist and murderer serving a life sentence for other crimes, confessed to committing the crime alone and DNA evidence confirmed his involvement in the rape. One of those five who were wrongfully convicted is here with us today. We want to welcome back Yusuf Salam to the show. Hey, Mr. Yusuf, how you doing today? Oh man, I am doing wonderfully actually. How's everything going? Oh man, I'm blessed. Thank you. You know what I'm saying? I definitely had to give you a good song to come in. You know, I, I got to get you revved up. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. <laughs> you, know you know what? It's funny because music, music has a tendency to um, um, do things to folks. You know what I'm saying? That's right. And it could be positive or negative, uh, which is one of the reasons why I think they really, um, on the flip side and on a, in a different type of a conversation, they, they hijacked hip-hop music and changed it from it being um, about positivity, Black Medallion's No Gold, the message being in the music and the music being in the message, to what we see nowadays where people ain't talking about nothing, you know, and people are being dumbed down to the realities of what's going on. That's right. You definitely right about that, and you definitely broke it down. But you know, I want to say last week, man, you 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 did a great job, and you know we had a lot going on, and you had great information, and I definitely want to bring you back and celebrate you. But let me tell you what happened again. So over the weekend, I had a young man that contacted me and Jeffrey. His name is Victor. He's on the phone right now, and he's fighting yep. a case. He's coming up uh, June the sixth is when he goes, you know, and uh, for his hearing or whatever. Now he's been in jail. He's out on bond right now, but he's. He, the, the charge is, um, I guess, uh, looting, what is it called, lewdness to a child or something like that? Is aggravated. It, what is it, uh, Victor? Uh, aggravated sexual assault to a child. Aggravated sexual assault to a child. Yeah. Now, now, what I want to do, I want to go to you, Yusef, because Obi then gave him some great advice. Jeffrey then gave him some great advice. My man, Jeffrey, you still with me? Absolutely, Koji. All right. So Jeffrey then gave him some great advice. Now, Yusef, you know, you went through this at a real young age, and you was in jail, and you was scrutinized. Your family went through a lot. Y'all was talked about so bad. Y'all was drugged through the mud. Even Donald Trump had something to say about y'all to try to put a black eye on y'all's case and everything. Can you please explain to this young man, Victor, why he needs to fight for his life and what it's like going in prison with a charge like that on your back? Well, I want to say this, first of all, you know, it, it, it definitely, everything you just said is 100% true and 100% accurate. But I think that sometimes um, the, the, the picture that I paint in terms of everything that was going on, um, even though that's true, has to be said a different way. Because folks who never went through it will look at that as, oh, that was that's okay, you know, hey, so people were talking about you, so what? You know, people talk about it, people all the time. Right. You know, this situation that happened to us, here we were 14, 15, and 16-year-olds, um, having had no prior um, criminal records, no involvement with the police other than seeing them in our neighborhoods and thinking that they were there to protect and serve. And then all of a sudden, our first involvement with the police um, rang true with what a lot of people who are involved with black liberation struggles and struggles in general. They say, you know what, they're there for nothing other than to give you CPR or you need CPR after dealing with them. It's not about them um, giving you courtesy, professionalism, and respect. You know, police officers are trained, number one, to distrust and mistrust the public. And once we come from that premise, then we can operate from a, a, a position of knowledge and a position of understanding. You know, and unfortunately, in our case, here they, they, they created a situation. They found a victim. 
and the victim had been raped. And then what they did was they went to the surrounding communities and they snatched up literally every young person that they could find. The only people that this story of the rapists who raped the Central Park jogger stuck to were individuals who were most vulnerable, myself included. You know, and so they, they, they stuck this to us, stuck this label to us. And if you can imagine, everywhere we went, everywhere we, we showed our faces, we walked on the train, our face was on every single newspaper. People were whispering as we walked by. You know, we just came, uh, just, just a brief uh, glimpse into what's happening today. Um, the Central Park Five uh, just received a Peabody Award. So we just came from an award ceremony. Ken Burns was there, and a lot of notable people were there. And I had mentioned, you know, we this situation that happened to us, man, people at one point in time were throwing spit at us. Not, you know, spitting on the street in front of us. They were like hawk spitting and trying to hit us with it. They were definitely throwing tomatoes and rotten eggs and all of that kind of stuff. And they didn't just do that to us, but they did that to our families. So to be in a situation now, we're talking about 25 years later and one month to the, to the date that this injustice happened to us. To be in a situation now where people are giving us accolades is amazing, you know? I'm but sure. back then, it wasn't nothing pretty to be associated with the Central Park Jogger case and to be one of the people who was known as having raped the Central Park Jogger. It, it, like you said... It was such a horrific situation that common citizens like Donald Trump took out full-page ads calling for the reinstatement of the death penalty. This was, this was a modern-day legal lynching. They were ready and getting us ready for uh, someone and anyone to go into our homes, drag us out of our homes, hang us from trees in Central Park in a similar way that they did Emmett Till. Mm -hmm. And that would be that. And I say that because... Sometime later, very shortly after, there was another article that was written by a guy named Pat Buchanan. And in his article, he says, if we took the eldest one and we hung him from a tree in Central Park, and we took the others and we horsewhipped them, maybe the city's park would be safe again. This is, this is the climate that was happening in 1989 and around the Central Park Jogging Day. And this is the climate that we were walking through and and trying to live our lives through. And we came home from that. We went to prison with that, with that scar. It wasn't a scar like, you know, people get tattoos and all of that stuff. We were branded, like, like cattle get branded. Beyond our, um, we didn't want to be branded, but we were branded with this, with this label of rapists. Right. And everyone knows that that's one of the worst brands to go to prison for. The inmates themselves were being polled in New York State. They were being asked, what are you going to do when you get your hands on them? You know, because everyone knew and knows that inmates have their own system of justice. And you rape someone, they, they rape you. You gang rape someone, then they gang rape you. This is just how it goes. It's an eye for an eye because they feel like the justice system isn't enough. I got assaulted myself, and I got assaulted by a guy who was told, why was I able to live on his house and not be assaulted? Mm. The guy assaults me, and when he was asked why he assaulted me, he said that, he said that very thing, well, my friends pressured me. And then, he, then I found out what the guy had been in prison for. This guy was a 15-year-old youngster who went into a home with some of his friends, killed all of the males in the house, raped all of the females in the house and took all of the babies and put them in the oven and burnt them and killed them. Mm. You see, so this was the type of, of reality that I was being faced with. And when I say that to fight, fighting is like, it, 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 it goes so far beyond that. It goes so far beyond, you know, hey, get, you know, put some gloves on and get ready for a big battle. This is 25 years later. We still have not received justice in my case. This is 25 years later. And, and to show you the significance of how messed up it is when the city or the, the system of justice, I call it the criminal system of injustice, but it's just to go show you how messed up it is when they drop the ball in a case like ours. 
There was a pregnant young Latina woman who was raped after the Central Park jogger got assaulted. She was raped while her children were in the other room. And the guy who raped her, his M.O. was that he would cut your eyes out or he would stab you to death. And so he would say, your eyes are your life. And the woman, I don't know what she said, but he began to stab her. And he said to Barbara Walters on Channel 7, he said, I don't know how many times I stabbed her. You know, this was a pregnant young Latina woman. Mm. He murdered her. This was the guy who everyone knew as the East Side rapist and the East Side slasher. This was the guy who our families were saying, you have the wrong people. The Central Park Five, the people you're labeling as the Central Park Five, did not do this crime. They didn't do it. The real perpetrator is out there, and he's continuing to hurt, continuing to rape, continuing to maim. And sure enough, he finally got caught. He's now serving 33 and a third years in prison for these crimes that he committed. But during that time, can you imagine this for a second? During that time, one of his cell buddies bunking in the same prison that he was bunking in was Corey Wise. Mm. And he kept his mouth shut for a while until one day he says, man, I got, I got counseling and I got God in my life. This guy didn't do this crime. I need to come forward and tell the truth about this. And it was Corey Wise, still languishing in prison 13 years later, who ultimately started the process of us being exonerated. But we came home to those labels as well, because I came home after seven years. Mm. Corey came home free person. He didn't come home to parole like we did. You know, so it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fight that you almost have to understand you got to become a marathon runner you got to become a triathlete that's right <laughs> you know but this is what happens to us and you can't let them just run over you at all you know victor yes what would you like to say to mr Youssef? um no. first you can start out by saying hello <laughs> <laughs> we all we always going. We, we always greet our guests on here. We we always oh, greet them. <laughs> um, no, I'm really I'm, just, I'm at a loss for words right now with everything that he said. You're a little shook up right now. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a it's a sick it's a sick and it's, it's a messed up situation when you're fighting against the system because. Unfortunately, in the, um, in the Constitution itself, the, the governing documents of this nation, what does it say in the 13th uh, Amendment? It says that uh, slavery is abolished except for those individuals that, got, that get put back into a state of slavery by getting arrested and, and, and put in prison. But, I mean, they're manufacturing these things. They're putting us into situations where we didn't, we didn't I mean, it's like legalized slavery. You know, back in the days, you had to walk around with the, with the, um, the, during the slave codes, you had to walk around with a card to prove and show that you had the right to be out there on the street walking around. You mm-hmm. had somebody's permission to do that. Right. You know, and this is the same stuff that goes on today. I think many of us, one of the things that, that we have to realize is that they're creating a situation where the male population is, is diminishing to such a degree that we're not there to protect our female counterparts and we're not there to become the men that we need to be. And so, therefore, if we have male children, who's there to raise our male children? And I'm not saying that the women aren't doing a tremendous job, you know, because I was in a single-family household myself. But, I mean, when you look at the design, I was talking to Ken Burns at one point in time, and I was saying to him how, you know, this whole thing that they did to us was a conspiracy. And I said they even have books written about this in our communities, The Conspiracy to Destroy the Black Boys, Volume 1, 2, and 3. And they even got books called The Conspiracy to Destroy the Black Girls. And Kim Burns said something that blew my mind. He said, there is no conspiracy. He said, we can't, as a society, wrap our minds around the devious nature of what these people do. And so we wrap it up in a nice package called a conspiracy. He said, this is part of the plan. They design things this way. This is what they do. You know, when they, when they, um, when they sentenced me, 
I had no idea, first of all, that I was going to get arrested and, I mean, that I was going to get locked up and I was going to go to prison because I thought the system. But when they sentenced me, they asked me if I had anything to say. And I felt like I couldn't go down without a fight. I felt like if any time this was the right time to stand up and say something. That's right. And I began, and, and part of my words were memorialized in the, in the New York City Post newspaper. And on the front of the newspaper, the very next day, it had the headlines, Salam Baloney. Mm. Um, one of the guys who's, who's a very famous um, filmmaker, Spike Lee, my words made it into one of his films. It's either Do the Right Thing or uh, Jungle Fever. I don't remember which one. Do the Right Thing. But it's in Do the Right Thing? Okay. Yeah. Um, where the guy picks up the paper and he starts reading some of my rhyme and then throws the paper across the room because it was that racial thing that was going on. Right. And all of the stuff that I was talking about in the rhyme was stuff that was happening to us as a people, stuff that happened to me as one of the members of the Central Park Five. And when I finished, you should have seen the, the look on the judge's face. He was so angry and upset. But it wasn't even like, it wasn't even like you, were, you were angry just because you were angry. I mean, this was like a, a seething angry. Like, I could, if I could kill this person, I would right now. Mm. This is the type of anger that he was looking at. This, this is how he looked. And when I tell you that he threw the book at us, they gave us six and two-thirds to 20 years. And the only reason why we didn't do six and two-thirds to 20 years was because we were being uh, tried as adults, but sentenced, sentenced as juveniles. And so they wrapped it up, and they said, okay, well, we can't give them that amount of time, but if we could, we would. We can only give them five to ten. Mm-hmm. And so they gave the, those of us who were under 16, they gave us five to ten. Those of us who were over 16, they gave us five to 15. Mm-hmm. You know you what? Know. Can, can can I say one thing real quick, uh, Yusef? Oh, yes, N- Not to interrupt you, but I, I just want to do this real quick. Uh, I just had somebody text me a minute ago. His name is Oz. He said that everybody today that has been speaking, y'all definitely moved him, motivated him. Y'all making him get more closer to his children. And then on top of that, he prays for each one of y'all, each and every one of y'all and what y'all's doing. So we are touching oh, people. I mean, Appreciate I've been getting that. texts the whole show. But what I want to do, I definitely want to let my team ask y'all some questions and give y'all some love as well. Miss Peaches, I'm going to come to you right now. What would you like to say to Jeffrey, Mr. Youssef, but also what would you like to say to Victor? Because Miss Peaches, I know you look at it like you have brothers. And if this was one of your brothers that had this on him right now, I know how you would feel. So what would you want to say to Victor first and then go down the line real quick? Okay, Victor, um, I just want to say to keep your head up and keep fighting. Um, you know, just being a mother type that I am, I hear in your voice that you're very broken right now. But all of these men on here have given you great advice. And one of the things that stuck out to my, in my head was uh, one of the gentlemen said, Innocents don't, innocent people do not get tired of fighting That's right. for their innocence and to be set free. <laughs> and so many of our guests, had to fight while they were locked down, and it's so much harder. So after you get off the show today with Koji and everybody, put yourself in motion to, to fight harder for the rest of today, tomorrow, and all the way until you are freed, you know, from the crime that you say that you're innocent of. And then, Koji, um, all your guests are so amazing. I, I've just been so intrigued the entire show. I haven't missed one part and i really appreciate everybody who's taken the time today to tell their story and to help and miss peaches you've seen the documentary the uh century park five what would you like to say to mr youssef about that i just want to say that i know that you're doing you and and the rest of the men, young men are doing really great things now but my heart still goes out to each and every one of you for your fight and what you went through and I just want to say thank you on behalf of all the young men that you guys are fighting for. They don't even realize how much you went through to get to where you are and how much you're still putting on the line to make it a better day for them. So I want to say personally thank you because I do have a lot of young men in my family 
you know, that I love very much. And I can't even imagine having been on the other side to see that happening to someone that I love. Well, thank you. And what would you say to Jeffrey about his tenacity, his fight? Well, you know, Jeffrey, um, you're a great man. I know you are working tirelessly, and I love it that you and Koji are hooked up doing this. And I, I think each and every show gets better. It's obvious that we're touching so many people with the show. And I know when you get tired, just know that our team is really rooting you on, and we're praying for you to not be tired through your fight. I really appreciate it, you know. I mean, Coach, I get energy, you know. I'm, I'm sure you do as well. I get energy when we hear, you know, positive statements, positive feedback from people, you know. It's, it's uh, very important, you know, in, in keeping our morale to, you know, that's remain right. strong, remain remain positive, you know, and it's right. just reinforcement is, is a powerful thing. That's right. Thank you. So I'm going to go to Foxy real quick. Foxy, what would you like to say to Mr. Youssef, Victor, and Jeffrey real quick? I just wanted to ask Youssef, did anybody, um, like you said, Donald Trump wanted the death penalty for y'all? Did he ever <laughs> Did he ever reach out to y'all, Any or anybody that really accused no y'all apology. of anything? Nobody reached out to no none of y'all? Not at all. You know, it's funny because there was a there was an article written by um, I forget his name, but he uh, Jimmy Breslin. Jimmy Breslin wrote an article, and in the article he he addressed that. And this is years ago where he was addressing this this um, thing that Donald Trump did, and he said, you know, you would think that um, uh, people would come out and and apologize because that's something that we do as as human beings. We make mistakes, you know. And if you make a mistake, you apologize. And, hey, that's the easiest way to make amends and move forward. He said, but this thing that Donald Trump did, he, in his arrogance, he sees this as dust for the maid to sweep up. You know, this wasn't something that was um, done as a means. And, you know, just this, this, this was something that... that um, the seated, deep seated racism. That's right. Came out and 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 bored. It wasn't even like I mean, we know we know folks who are white who love black people. Right. And I know that racism isn't deep enough so that every white person is is racist. That's not the reality. Right. But when you have folks who that is their core, then that is their core. That is who they are. They don't apologize for things like that. That's right. You know, and the most unfortunate thing was that we were written up in in history books. Mm -hmm. They taught people about us in school. Mm -hmm. They never went back and corrected that wrong. They created laws after arresting and convicting the Central Park Five. Mm. They never went back and reversed the laws that they create, created. You know, all of these terms that they have nowadays, these super predators, and they were calling us urban terrorists. And wilder. They never went back and corrected that. Right. They created the term, where well, they created the definition wilder. of what wilding was mm -hmm. to, the, to the public at large. Wow. Because people use that term sometimes loosely in the communities we came from. Right. But it wasn't used in the way that people were saying that we would, you know, they, they, they said, no, this is the definition of wilding. This is what they're doing, you know. And, I mean, you know, hey, we see somebody dancing on the street. We're like, oh, wow, that guy's wilding out. Right. Mm -hmm. You know. But this whole thing, this, this was a phenomenon. They were, they were seizing on the fears of the public mm -hmm. and making everyone believe that if you saw young black and brown people walking around, they were up to no good. Mm-hmm. We could never be about nothing other than buffoonery, other than mischief, other than hatred. And I mean, it's so, it's so funny because, you know, sometimes when you look at what the comedians say about reverse racism and things like that, you know, this one guy said something like, you know, you, you see white women sometimes clutch their purse when you walk into an elevator. That's right. You know, but we, in reality, we should be clutching our stuff. <laughs> because the history of Got black right. and brown folks in this country wasn't that we immigrated here. The history was that we were forced over here. We were made to build this country up. The burden on our backs is so great. And then that when they, when they uh, uh, finally so-called reversed slavery, 
they said, hey, we're going to give you guys 40 acres in the music so you can make it up. You know, we're going to give you guys something that, so that you can pull yourselves up from your bootstraps. And people are still waiting for reparations. Yeah, they treated us like a dog. To kidnap somebody and treat them like an animal? I mean, it, it, you know. What's it's, worse? It's, it's, I'm going to tell you what's worse. What's worse is not that. What's worse? is to completely annihilate and erase the history of those people so that they perpetuate, they perpetuate that madness amongst themselves. Yeah. You got young people walking around today who believe that slavery was thousands of eons ago. Mm -hmm. Slavery was just yesterday. Today. People was, just yesterday, people were sicking dogs on people's mamas. And I say people's mamas because... We know in the civil rights struggle that it was mostly the women that were out there fighting for the rights of the people. And that's a serious statement to make right there. That's a reality that, you know, you would think, hey, the men stood up and stand, you know, that's not what happened. Right. And that's, that's something that we have to own and we have to realize. That's why, you know, in speaking to this young brother today, one of the things that we don't know what we're giving back just by standing up and struggling and fighting. You know, even if we, even if we die, and I'm, I mean that literally, we stood up and we fought because everybody is guaranteed death, but That's not right. everybody is guaranteed life. You got that right. And I mean that figur figuratively and literally. And, and I, I mean, even the work... That you, Brother Koji, are doing and, and, and Brother Jeffrey is doing, this is tremendous work. Thank you, brother. This is work that is so much needed. And even to hear Jeffrey talk about the, the, the uh, sometimes he's tired. Man, I, I so understand where Jeffrey is coming from because it takes a nation of millions to correct this wrong. You got that right. But we are only few and far in between that are standing up and being counted. That's right. You right about that. Can we do this real quick, Mr. Youssef? I mean, you definitely broke it down, man. You know I got so much love for you. And you know, hey, this show is your home, too. You always got a seat here with us, and we do appreciate mm. you. And like I said, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know what more I can say to let you know that me and Jeffrey got your back 100%. Man, I appreciate that. Just and, to know that. Oh, yeah. I appreciate that. <laughs> Definitely. I appreciate it. Now, check this out. This is what I want to do, and I feel like this is a special part of the show that we should do this. I was sitting here a minute ago, and I was listening to you, and you was talking about fighting, you know, for your life, and you should go all out like hell to fight for this one life that God has blessed you with, the high power, Buddha, whoever you believe in. You got this one life, and you got to hold on to it. Now, what I want to do, Victor, are you still with me? Yes, I'm still here. Victor, put your parents on the phone for me for a second. Uh, they're right here. They can hear you. Okay. How y'all doing today, ma'am and sir? Good. How about you? Thank you. All right. Now, what I want to do right now, I want to I wanna tell y'all that I definitely commend you all for fighting for your son's life and, you know, definitely putting up all your hard earnings. And, you know, that's what good parents should do when they really believe in their children and believe that the children are innocent. But as some that know, that, I mean, I watch some that know their children are bad as hell and they still put up money and lose everything over children who are not going to stop. Uh, as you know, you have said wilding in the street doing everything that they really are deliberately doing. So when you got parents that are fighting for somebody who's innocent and they losing everything, that's a very hurting thing. That's a very hurting thing. So you self real quick. I want you and Jeffrey to talk to these parents right now who are definitely on her supporting their child. And they've been listening to the show. They've been right beside their son the whole time listening to this interview and hearing how we also are fighting for him. But we are rooting for him to win. We are rooting for this young man to survive. We are rooting for this young man to say, no, this life is mine. I will not give it up without a fight of proving my innocence. You get what I'm saying? Yes, indeed. Yes, yes, indeed. So if you can, uh, real quick, Yousef, if you can please say something to the parents and then Jeffrey. Man, um, I, w I was looking for a piece of poetry that I wrote because I think that poetry, especially poetry that is, that is done in a very succinct fashion, kind of speaks to uh, the souls of folks, you know. Um, but when you have, one of the, well, well, first of all, let me say this. One of the greatest warriors that I had in my corner was my mother. That's right. 
That's true. And when I say that, I mean, my mother wore a Yusuf is Innocent shirt every single day. People thought she was wearing the same shirt. She had made droves of these shirts up, got them tie-dyed and made up. And when we were finally found to be innocent and they vacated our convictions, there's this famous photo that was being circulated in the New York Times where she was out there with her, her jacket wide open with the Yusef is Innocent shirt right on, you know. And when I tell you it's tremendous to be there like that, no one in our, in our, um, in our immediate surroundings plays a more important role than our parents. That's right. And I mean, when you are there for us, Oh my goodness! It is it is so powerful. That's right. It is so powerful, and it's needed though because you don't you don't understand the amount of strength that you give to our children. Like when I look back at my mom, I can't do anything. Um, you know, they, 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 there's a, there was a famous. Um, we down to five uh, minutes. Uh, we gotta hurry. Oh, I'm sorry. This okay. is real quick. There was a famous piece of uh, work that said the guy said he was carrying his mother on his back. Right, and he said, "Have I paid my mother back? I carry my mother on my back every day, every night, every when she wants to go, I carry her." And he said, "You have not paid your mother back one contraction until you carry it on your back." <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's deep. That is really deep. That is really deep. Let me do this real quick, Yusef. That was great advice. Jeffrey, what would you like to say to his parents? You know, I want to say I definitely commend you all for what y'all doing and the bravery that y'all showing that y'all put up all y'all's earnings to prove that y'all's baby is innocent. Because no matter how old a child is, it's always your baby. Go ahead, Jeffrey. You know, one one uh, really uh, good thing, you know, my mother did that I, that, you know, I wish I would have knew to ask her to do more of. Uh, there was one time where she did, because every time I went to, uh, every time I made a court appearance, and my case was very uh, high profile, so every time I made a court appearance, all the local media were, was covering it, and, you know, they were writing all their articles and pieces, like from a guilt, guilt-presumptive-oriented uh, perspective. And uh, that was part of the media bias, but part of that bias was because, you know, my lawyer wasn't willing to speak up for me in the press, and he was always telling me not to speak, and meanwhile, the cops and, and the prosecutors, they were speaking on the case, and this is what, you know, the media was regurgitating what, what, they, were, what they were saying. So all the, all the information, all the comments was flowing one way. I, mean, I remember one time my mother just got tired of all the negative coverage, and, and she did speak with one of the reporters, and we got, like, one, one, one article, one good article, you know, came out in my behalf. And looking back in hindsight... You know, I, I wish that I would have known to ask her to do more of that. So I think my advice is that it's important to have uh, a, a media strategy. Don't let the information, you know, come only from one side. And, you know, while he's going to a court and court proceedings, maybe he can't speak uh, to the media himself, but, you know, you guys can do it as, as, as surrogates. So I would encourage you to, you know, Come up with the media strategy. Speak with your lawyer, but make it clear that you know. No, I'm not, while while the coverage, you know, articles and, and coverage is coming out, you know, about us, so we're not going to just be quiet and make no comments and let right. all this prejudicial information uh, come from one side. We're going to counter it. So it's not a matter of you know whether we're going to speak or not. We're going to speak. It's just right. that we want to coordinate with you as to what our talking points are. So we no. can either do that with you with the coordination, or we can do without. Okay. So, but, but so uh, words, definitely fight back to the media and have served if you're in a perfect position uh, to do that. Okay. There it is. So, Victor, to your parents, you know, hey, we got a lot of love for them, and that's why I wanted to make it personal here towards the end of the show. We're down to three minutes. I definitely want to say, Mr. Youssef, you know, man, uh, I got so much love for you. I'm going to be pulling to you. Jeffrey, you already know, man, we, we, we in this together. We Cape Crusaders, you know. We definitely fighting this fight. <laughs> to my whole team, I got so much love for y'all. My research team, y'all the best. My boy guy, you know I got love for you. My producer, Jay, you keep it hot for me and Jeffrey. But to everybody out there, I just want to say that everybody on this phone, we all got huge hearts. We could be anywhere in the world, but we right here right now doing what we're doing for the love of the people. 
So please respect us, respect our movement, tell people about us, run and tell everything, you know, that y'all can about the movement of what we're doing, Mr. Youssef, you know, Obi and, uh, you know, Jeffrey and me, myself. You know, we, we really trying, but we need the word of mouth to really get out there and help us even more. So, you know, because that's what means a lot. But we definitely coming together again and we're going to make a difference. And I want to thank you again, Mr. Youssef. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. All right, and I'll be bringing you back through. Jeffrey, much love to you. I'll be talking to you later today. And, Victor, thank you as well. And I will be talking to you after the show today, Victor. We got uh, Jeffrey's number for you. And, everybody, you have been listening to I've Been Falsely Accused Part 16. I'm the host, Koji, and my man, Mr. Jeffrey Deskovic. And looking forward to greater shows to come. We got a lot of interviews that's coming. And I want to thank Miss Laura Carwell. I want to thank Mr. Antoine Day. Obi Anthony and Mr. Uh, Youssef Salam. It takes a team to fight this situation. No one man can do this. The love that we have for our community, let it shine bright through our fight. All right? Much love, everybody. Y'all be safe. Just you and me.